Hello, in this video I'm going to take you through the May 2019 J276 Computer Science GCSE 9 to 1 Unit 1 paper. It's a non-calculated paper and it's out of 80 points. Question 1. Kerry wants to buy a new computer, but she does not understand what the different parts of a computer do. Kerry has heard of a CPU, but does not know what it is. The following sentences describe the purpose of a CPU. Complete the sentences by filling in the missing words. CPU stands for, and that's quite a straightforward one, it's Central Processing Unit. It's the part of the computer that fetches and executes the, and that'll be the instructions. that are stored in there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say for where it's stored, sometimes we would refer to it as RAM. The exam board quite often likes to refer to it as the main memory. Either of those answers would be fine. The CPU contains the arithmetic something unit and here we've got written ALU, so we know it begins with L. So it's clearly gonna be the logic unit. And the something unit, here it says CU, and so it's gonna be something that begins with C, which is the control unit. Hey, these are all terms from um, topic 1.1. You just need to really memorize them and go through them. Part two, Kerry's looking at two computers. One has a single core processor, and the other has a dual core processor. Explain why having a dual core processor might improve the performance of the computer. So why is a dual port core processor gonna improve it? It's a two mark question. So what we could do first of all, is we could explain what a dual core processor is. So we could say a dual core processor um, is where there are two processors or cores, okay? And then what we want to do is we want to explain, well, what's the benefit of this? So we could say um, instructions, because that's what we're processing. Can, miss the R, can be processed in parallel. And that means that, um, that means that it can be processed at a faster rate as well. Meaning that um, instructions, sorry, I'm not very good at typing today. A faster rate at the same time, because they're done at the same time, because they're processed at the same time. We could also talk about the fact that this enables multitasking. Okay, so I think I've got about four marks there. Well, I've covered about four points for a two mark question. Part three. One computer has 64 kilobytes of cache and the other has 512 kilobytes of cache. Explain how the cache size can affect the performance of the CPU. Okay, so for this question, let's start by defining and explaining what cache is. So, cache is fast memory that is used to store frequently used instructions. Good, okay. Now what we want to do is we want to say what's the impact of cache. So we want to explain that the instructions that are stored can be quickly accessed, meaning they don't need to be fetched, decoded, um, and it makes your access times quicker. The instructions can be accessed from the cache, let's say access quickly, the cache, rather than needing to be fetched decoded from the RAM. 
We just need to explain this makes access times quicker. Now what we need to do is we need to explain how the size of the cache impacts performance. So we can say the bigger the cache, the more instructions that can be stored. And we can explain that that means that your computer will have quicker access times. Um, And what we need, what we can do, it's not necessary for this one, but I just want to show you so you can get into the habit of it. Well, let's apply it to the scenario. The scenario being the 64 kilobytes of cache for one computer and the other being 512. So we can say the computer with 512 kilobytes of cache will be faster than the one with 64 kilobytes because there is more to store frequently used instructions. Part B. Both computers have RAM and ROM. The table has five statements describing RAM and ROM. Tick one or more boxes in each row to identify if that statement describes RAM and or ROM. So let's just quickly recap them. RAM, it's... Um, it's a memory which stores data and instructions for applications that are currently open. It's volatile, which means that when the power is turned off, um, it forgets everything. Whereas ROM stands for read only memory. So technically you can only write to it. It's long term, it's permanent, and it stores data for things such as the BIOS when you start up your computer. So stores data. Well, we just said that both of them store data. I'm going to put crosses in. You put a tick in. Volatile, we said that's RAM because it forgets when you turn it off. Data will not be lost when the computer is turned off. Well, that's literally the opposite of volatile, so it's going to be ROM. It's long-term memory. Data is read-only, cannot be changed. We said this before, read-only. Um, it's the name ROM, read-only memory. Stores currently running data and instructions. That's the RAM. We said that at the beginning. Give one difference between... RAM and flash memory. So this is a bit of a tricky one because it's really hard to define the difference between these. So what we want is we want to just come up with one difference between ROM, sorry, between RAM and flash memory. So the big thing is if you think of flash memories um, like your ROM really, and the thing I would always say is that RAM is volatile. Okay. You could really choose almost anything from this list up here, but if we stick with that one, RAM is volatile. Part C. Kerry has five gigabytes of files to transfer from her laptop at work to her new computer. She's been told to buy an external solid state device to do this. Give one example of a solid state device. So a solid state device, section 1.3 of the spec, it's basically anything without a moving part, okay? So that could be your USB sticks, memory cards, SD cards, any of those. Whatever you do, do not write USB on its own. Sometimes people write USB, meaning a USB stick or a memory stick or USB memory stick. But if you just write USB on its own, it's not acceptable. It needs to be USB memory stick, or it could be a USB stick or USB memory, okay? Part two, identify whether the, whether the device given in part CI, so the last question, is an example of primary or secondary memory. So basically anything that is long-term storage is secondary. When we talk about primary, that's talking about RAM. RAM is known as primary or main memory, as we spoke about in the last question a while ago. Um, secondary is your long-term storage with your hard drives, your USBs, your optical storage. So this would be secondary. Part three. Kerry was originally going to use an optical storage device to transfer her files. Discuss whether an optical or solid state device is the most appropriate media to transfer these files. You may want to consider the following characteristics in your answer. 
portability, robustness, capacity, cost. So what I would do first of all in addressing this question, I would define optical and define solid state. Once you've done that, you want to compare the characteristics. Now, I know it says you may want to consider them, um, meaning it's kind of optional, but, um, but you wanna really cover all of them. Finally, I would move on and conclude, which would be the most appropriate, and you need to reference or apply it to the scenario. So let's go through it now. So let's start with solid state, because we've just done that one. Solid state storage devices have no moving parts and consist of transistors which transfer data using electrical um, pulses, let's say, okay? Or you could say signals. Optical storage, um, we wanna say consists of disks, which um, have bumps on them. Let's just say it's high and low. And these represent the data that is written to them. Okay, so we've defined them. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare the characteristics. So let's start with portability. So we can say um, solid state devices can be quite small. meaning they are very portable. Um, then we could talk about optical. Optical are also portable and can be carried around because they are small. Okay, um, robustness next. However, um, optical are not very robust because if you scratch a CD, your work will be lost, or we could even say corrupted. Okay, um, solid state devices. have no moving parts, meaning they are very robust. If you drop one, um, it will not necessarily be damaged. So that's robustness capacity. Um, so we can say solid state devices can store a lot of data. However, um, optical devices not. So let's put some references in here to just show the depth of our understanding. So okay, CDs can store 700 megabytes, where as, well sorry, and Blu-rays can store um, 25 gigabytes of data. This is not much compared to solid state. Okay, 
So we've done that one. Now we're gonna move on to the cost, okay? So cost, um, we could talk about the optical is very small per gigabyte. Let's put cheap down just to be a bit more explicit. Okay, um, but the thing is, um, you could talk about the fact that um, the solid state can be reused more times, you can rewrite to it. Rewritten to. Okay. Right, so now we're on to our conclusion. So you're going to say which one would be the most appropriate and why apply it to the scenario. So I'm going to say solid state would be the most appropriate. Okay. And we need to say, well, what's the person's name? Was it Kerry? Okay. Um, so we can, let's say why, and let's refer back to these characteristics. So we can say, um, it is portable. And we can, but let's be honest, we need to give a balanced argument. So it's portable, like um, optical. However, I'm using that word a lot. It is um, more robust and let's apply it to the scenario. Therefore, Kerry, Kerry's work is less likely to be corrupted and lost. Okay, so we've put that one in. The next point that we want to cover um, is the amount of data. So we could say, um, we could talk about the fact that um, she could get a device, she could get a Blu-ray which can store 25 gig of data, but however, over the years, her work might increase beyond the capacity of solid state, of um, optical. Um, Kerry currently only has 25 gigabytes of data. So she would need a Blu-ray um, however, again, if she wanted more to store more than 25 GB of data, she would need multiple disks. But solid state a solid state device will be able to store all of her work. Finally, let's talk about cost. Um, we could say um, optical would be cheaper, but she can all she might she will need to rewrite to her work and um, rewrite to her her device as her work changes. Okay, so that's the whole of that question. Obviously I've got a few typos in there and it doesn't flow very well. I've used the word however about a hundred times. And um, that's because I'm rushing through it, but in the exam I'd expect you to take a bit more time and make sure yours flows a bit better. Part four. The file sizes of Kerry's files are usually displayed in megabytes, MB, or gigabytes, GB. Calculate how many megabytes are in five gigabytes. Show your working out. Well, okay, so the first thing we need to be aware of is that there are 1,024 megabytes in a gigabyte. Bear in mind, this isn't a calculator paper. You're actually allowed to round it down to 1,000. If you calculate it in 1024, or a thousand, you'll get the mark. So we've got a thousand, and we need to multiply that by five because there's five gigabytes, which is gonna give us five thousand, and we need to put the MB down. So looking at this, um, you're gonna get 
I'm not too sure what you get the marks for, but you've got um, the working out on there to cover us. And we've got the answer with the extension. Question two. Xander's tablet computer comes with system software, including an operat operating system and utility software. The operating system provides file management. Identify three ways that Xander can use, can make use of file management facility. So three different ways. So if you look, it's a three mark question. So we're gonna just um, list them basically. So he can use it to, let's say he can use it to rename files. And we need to specify that it's files. We can't say stuff or it. He can use it to delete files. And another would be, he can use it to move files. So basically it's anything that you could do in a folder. So it could be um, potentially creating um, a new folder. It could be to search them, to copy, um, things like that to open folders as well. Part B, the utility system software provides compression software. Sander uses this to compress an image. Explain how the image compression software compresses the image. So that's a bit of a weird one what he's asking because you could answer it in one sentence. So let's start off by defining um, compression. And then we can talk about how it works. Um, we can explain the different types and then explain how they work. Okay, so, so we could start off by saying compression uses an algorithm to remove data that is unnecessary or will not be missed. Okay, so we've actually gone over, I've explained what it is there. Um, I can actually say it makes the file size smaller. Okay, but what I would have just said is, yeah, is that really? How it works, we've actually just covered how it works with the whole thing of taking out unnecessary data. Um, the different types, so we can say there are two types um, lossy and lossless. Good. Um, and then we're going to explain how they work. And we could just say um, lossy is permanent deletion. Whereas um, lossless can um, the deleted data can be restored. Okay, and I think that should be enough to get us the full marks. Again, sorry about the typos. Part two: Give the name of two other types of utility software. So we just need to list two types of utility software. So that could be anything that could be your antivirus and it could be a firewall. Part C, Xander also has a smartwatch. Tick one box to show whether the smartwatch or a laptop is an example of an embedded system. So let's remind ourselves what an embedded system is. An embedded system is a device with a computer system built in and they generally do something uh, like perform a specific task. So a smartwatch you could say is a watch with a computer inside of it. A laptop is a, it's just the computer. Okay, is what we call a general purpose computer. So it would actually be a smartwatch. Justify your choice to part one. So that's exactly what we've just discussed. So 
we first of all defined it. So an embedded system is a device with a computer system built into it. Um, they generally perform a specific function. Um, and then we could say a smartwatch is a watch with a computer, or you could say microprocessor built into it, whereas a laptop is a general purpose um, computer. There we go, and that's our two marks. Question three. Hamish stores confidential documents on his laptop. Hamish needs his computer to be secure from unauthorized access when connected to a network. Describe the problems that can arise from unauthorized access to his laptop and confidential documents. Now, I think one of the things which comes to mind here for me is the Data Protection Act. And that might be a valid answer, but let's just bear in mind that the question actually doesn't specify that it's work files or anything like that, but it does say it's confidential. Um, so the first thing we could say is that the data could be stolen. And um, we could say it's stolen by um, the hack or oh, by the third party. Okay, um, it's a three mark. So we need to really come up with three different points. Um, we could also say the data could be changed or deleted. Okay, and we need to explain that a bit more, meaning um, that his work is changed or lost. Um, we could also talk about the fact that um, they could also put malware on a bullet. Let's use that um, Data Protection Act. So we could say, um, we could talk about the fact that it's required. So the Data Protection Act requires data to be secure. This would mean that the data was not secure and be a breach of privacy okay part two describe two ways that hamish can prevent unauthorized access to his laptop so if you look we need to put two ways however it's a four mark question so what we need to do is we need to make sure we explain them so two ways that we could do is the password and another way that we could do let's say for example um firewalls okay now that's only two of the four marks so let's explain it so now we could say um people cannot access the files without data without the password And let's just go into a bit more detail. Let's say it must be a strong password. And let's explain what we mean by that. Um, so it has to have at least characters, eight characters. Um, a number, um, a letter, one uppercase character. And one lowercase character may be a special symbol slash punctuation okay and firewalls let's explain what our firewalls do all they do is they monitor the data coming in and out of the network and block anything which is unauthorized There we go. Part B. 
If an unauthorized access does occur, Hamish would like to use encryption to add another layer of protection to his computer. Explain how encryption helps to protect Hamish's documents. So all we're doing here is explaining how encryption works. So first of all, we want to say that encryption uses an algorithm. to scramble data using a key. Okay, and um, then we can say that um, once it's encrypted, the same key needs to be used to decrypt the data. And we can say used by the recipient or by an authorized person And we can say, we need to explain why this is useful now. You can say that while the data is encrypted, if it is um, accessed by someone, um, if, if unauthorized access does occur, then the data will not be understood. While the data is encrypted, if it is accessed, by someone unauthorized, it will not be possible for them to understand. Part two, one encryption method is a Caesar cipher. This Caesar cipher moves each letter of the alphabet one place to the right. The following table shows the original letters in the first row and the new letters in the second row. For example, the message read hello. This would be stored as IFMMP. The following pseudo algorithm takes a string of uppercase letters as input and uses the Caesar cipher to encrypt them. The functions used in the algorithm are described in the table. So we've got the ASCII function, which returns the ASCII value for the character. For example, ASCII A returns 65. Char, which takes in an ASCII value, returns the single character for ASCII value. So char 65 returns an uppercase A. Substring, which takes in a value and a number and returns the number of the characters starting at position value, which is the first one taken in. So for example, zero would be the first character. So that's very important, it's zero based. Okay, so complete the pseudocode to perform the Caesar cipher. So we're gonna just do pseudocode for this based on what we've got above and it's just filling in the gaps. So the first part is message, please enter your string. So that's line one, we're gonna put in the string that we want to um, encrypt. New message, I guess that's your new message, that's why it's empty, it's speech mark, speech mark. Message length is message.length, so that's telling us how many characters there are. Now we've got a for loop, so it's gonna be for count equals zero two. Um, and all we're gonna be looping through really is all of the characters in the message. And a bit of a hint there is that the line above is message length. So I'm gonna say from zero to message length. Now I said earlier, um, if we look back at the substring question um, function, it says where zero is the first character and our for loop goes from zero to message. So actually what we wanna do is we want to make sure that we're working zero base. So we're gonna take one away from that because if we've got 10 characters, is gonna end at nine. So we've got to make sure we don't end up with any kind of errors. So ASCII value, so ASC message substring, okay. So ASCII value, so that's gonna be um, the, the, the value, the number for the letter ultimately, isn't it? So ASC, that one, just having a quick look, 
Yeah, so that returns the number for the letter. So we need to get the letter. So we're getting an individual letter. So from message, we're going to get a character. And here we've got the comma one. So that means we only want to get one character. And it's really what character do we want to get? So we want to start at the beginning. So ideally that would be zero. But we're going to go through each one over and over. So it's looping, which takes us back to our line four, which is our loop. And the variable count on our loop is currently set to zero, but with each iteration, it's gonna increase. So the first time it will be zero, then when it runs again, it will be one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this to count because count is gonna increase by one with each iteration. All right, line six, ASCII value equals ASCII value plus. Okay, that's quite straightforward because what happens is that with our, um, encryption all it does is it adds one to each number so it's going to be ascii value plus one right then if the ascii value is greater than 90 then ascii value equals minus something minus 26 okay so 26 that's the number of um letters in the alphabet so i would presume because we've got only got 26 letters, something might happen. So say for example, if we just go up to the top here, say your letter Z, we need it to go back to A. Now, if we just add one on, um, then we might hit 91, for example, but actually we need it to go all the way back here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 20, if we go over, we're gonna take 26 away from our ASCII value. So we're gonna say ASCII value again, Okay, that's sort of got my case wrong. Okay, that's quite a tricky one on that. Then we've got new message equals. Okay, so new message on line two, we said that was gonna be our new encrypted message, wasn't it? Then we've got something plus um, char of the ASCII value. So the ASCII value is the number. Char is going to return a letter. Okay, so what we're doing is we're adding the letter onto the end of something. So basically what this is, what we want to do is each time it runs, we want to add that new letter onto the end of new message. So it's actually going to be new message. So new message is going to be new message plus the new character. Then we get it. And each time we just add the new character onto the end. That's quite a tricky task. Part three, the algorithm needs adapting. An extra line, line 12, is needed to output the encrypted message. Write line 12 to output the encrypted message in pseudocode or programming code. So what this is asking us to do is to output, output could mean print the encrypted message. So basically we need to print the encrypted message. Now to do that, all we need to do is to print the variable which stores the message, which is now called new message. So it's as straightforward as print new message. Make sure your case is all the same because we wanna, you need to make sure it's identical and you don't want any speech marks in there. Question four, an office has a LAN, local area network. The office has four employees who each have a laptop. The office also has one server and one network printer. The office is set up as a star network with a switch at the center. All devices are connected to the network using cables. Draw the devices and connections in the office star network. All devices must be clearly labeled. So what this is asking us to do is to just map the network, to just draw it. So if we look here, it says a switch is at the center. So in the center, let's put a switch. Okay, you might wanna draw a circle or a line around things just to put them in a box. Um, what else have we got on our network? So at the top is that it has four employees who each have a laptop. So I'm gonna do four laptops. Laptop there. And I'll just do one down here. Okay. The office has one server. and one networked printer. Okay. And now we just need to show how they're connected together. 
So I'm just going to draw some lines on here. And there we are. Part two, describe the role of the switch in the office network. So first and foremost, a switch connects devices together. Good, okay, then we can explain how they work. So we can say that they direct packets um, to its destination and only its destination because that's the difference between it and a hub. A hub sends it to all devices, but a switch directs packets only to their destination. There we go, two points for two mark question. The office introduces a WAP, wireless access point, to allow network access to wireless devices. The office manager has noticed that the performance of the network has recently decreased. Describe how introducing wireless access could have slowed down the network. So this is quite a straightforward question. So first and foremost, wireless transmission is slower than cabled. Okay. Second of all, let's kind of explain why. And we can say, because it can be, it can have interference. Such as walls. Good. Identify two other factors that can affect the performance of the network. So again, it's two points for a two point question. So we can talk about bandwidth available, which is effectively the speed. And another could be the number of users. Good. Explain what is meant by a virtual network. Now they've given us lots of lines, but if we look, this is only a two mark question again. So we can say it's a network that is not physical, it's logical. Good. And then we need to go into a bit more detail so we can say that um, there's a private network that is running on a public network. Good. And we could say that um, the users of the private network cannot communicate with the, um, sorry, the users of the public network cannot communicate with the private network. Good. Question five. The IP address 192.149 dot one one nine dot two two six is linked to the website with the URL https ocr dot org dot uk. When the when https www dot ocr dot org dot uk is entered into a browser, the website homepage is loaded. Describe the relationship between the website URL the web sorry between the website URL https www dot ocr dot org dot uk the IP address and the web server. So there's three things that we need to cover there. So let's start off by explaining the website is hosted on the web server and that basically means stored. So the website is stored. I'm going to say hosted and put stored in brackets on a web server. Okay. And this web server has an IP address of 192.149.119.226. Okay, that's quite straightforward. So we've done IP address, we've done web server. Okay, um, let's talk about that. So we've got the URL 
to Cabernet. So we can say the browser sends the URL to the DNS. Okay, and then the DNS finds the IP address. The relevant Then the IP address is sent back to the browser. Okay, so back to the browser. And then the browser requests the, um, the makes the request from the web server. And if it was something like Google, um, the web server would have to process any requests and send them back. There we go. So we've got a lot of um, space to answer this. This is a five, eight mark. Let me just check five mark question. So it's not quite eight mark. So it's not looking for context. What it's looking for is just looking to see that you know the process. Um, lots of lines which suggest there's a lot of possible answers. We need to just make sure we um, hit as many as possible. Part B. Computers access the internet using the TCP IP model. The TCP IP model uses layers, including the application layer and transport layer. Explain why the TCP IP model uses layers. So this is just the question basically of what is the purpose of layers. So we can say that um, each layer has its own purpose and we could talk about how different protocols um, are easier to manage because of that. It's only a two mark question despite the number of lines they've given, they've given you. Um, so we were saying each layer has its own purpose. Um, you can say this means that the protocols are easier to manage. Okay. You could also say that layers can be changed without affecting other ones because they're all separate. Part two, TCP IP is one example of a protocol. Give the name of one appropriate protocol for each task in the table. So send in an email, or, sorry, send in an email from one mail server to another. For sending emails, you use SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Transmitting a file from a client to a server, hints in that again, file, so it's gonna be FTP, File Transfer Protocol. Viewing a website using a web browser. So to view a website, we use HTTP, or you might want to put HTTPS down. Downloading an email to your computer, it's possibly, possibly going to be two. I'm going to go for pop three. Make sure you put the three on. The other one could be IMAP. Question six. Fiona is a software engineer. She's creating a new version of a computer game she released three years ago. Fiona is considering selling the game online and not making it available in physical shops. Describe the environmental impact of Fiona's decision. So Fiona's going to create a game. She's going to, she's thinking about sell, selling it online and not in shops. So you could compare it like with some PlayStation or Xbox games. What's the benefit to the environment of them being sold online rather than in shops? So the first thing is there is going to be no, cause they're not, they're not produced in a factory. So there's going to be less pollution. So. Yep. 
Okay, good. Um, another fact that you could consider is the fact that because it's going to be produced, um, because they're not delivering it, um, there's no packaging and therefore there's going to be less waste. Part B, Fiona releases her game under the proprietary license. Explain why a proprietary license is a more appropriate choice than open source. Okay, so when I think of proprietary, I think of it as closed source, which isn't a real term, but you've got open source where it's free, anybody can access it, and you've got proprietary, which is the complete opposite. So the first thing is that she's, this is a business, she wants to make money. So if she sells it under proprietary, um, she can charge people for it. So we'll be able to charge a fee for the game rather than give people free access. Good. And then you could also talk about the fact that um, by doing it this way, it means that she retains the copyright to her source code um, and it can't be distributed. It will also mean Because the, one of the key things with um, copyright, with open source, is that it's actually the source code is available and that can be distributed and copied and edited for free. Good. And that's it. We've got two points there for a two point question.